Welcome back everyone to another episode of The Road Shows Me. My name's Dan and on today's episode, let's talk about the research and the planning I've been doing to investigate importing a 70 series Land Cruiser into North America. So there's no doubt about it, the 70 series Land Cruiser, it is the number one vehicle to drive around the world with legendary reliability, huge payload, really great parts and support network. The 70 series around the world is the number one four wheel drive. There were plenty of countries in Africa where it outnumbered every other four wheel drive put together. So to drive around the world, it is a brilliant choice. But I live in Canada. Lots of you guys live in America. What is it like to actually import one? What are the realities of bringing one over? Let's get into all the details on today's episode. So obviously there's a few different 70 series Land Cruisers I could choose from. And here in Australia, they are absolutely plentiful. There's one sitting across the road from my dad's house right now. When I drive into town, I see 10 or 20 just on my drive to town. So there are plenty around. The really, the number one that many people would choose is called the 78 series. This is the troop carrier. So it has bench seats down both sides, huge internal volume. It's easy to have a huge payload. And since about 2007 or 2008, they came with the four and a half liter turbo diesel V8, which a lot of people really like. Before that, they came with the 1HZ straight six turbo diesel. And those are bulletproof reliability, easily do a million kilometers, half a million miles without any kind of engine work. So in terms of reliability, both of those are really great choices. Of course, there's also the 79 series. This is the pickup truck version and you have all different options if you get one of those. You could mount a canopy, you could mount some sort of camper. Options are really endless there. Same engine choices, essentially. There's also the 76 series, which is much more just like a regular SUV. Again, lots of people like these. If you're gonna mount a rooftop tent, no problem at all. So there's a lot of different choices there. And each one of those I think has pros and cons, but let's just move on from that for now. Let's just say I'm going to pick one of them. What does that look like? What do we need to consider? Let's go through all of those things right now. So the first major consideration here is legality. What's it like trying to import a vehicle into North America that was never sold there from the factory? And I should just add too, remember, when we're driving around the world as overlanders, we're talking about just being tourists. So we're temporarily importing our vehicle through countries as we move along. Our vehicle will stay registered and insured in our home country, and we just get permission to temporarily pass through any given country maybe for a month, maybe three months. That is a completely different thing than what I'm talking about right now and in today's video. I'm talking about bringing a vehicle from somewhere else in the world, happens to be Australia right now, bringing it over to North America and making it a legally registered and insured vehicle in North America, whether that's the USA or whether that's Canada. And so that is a totally different story. You have to get customs permission, it has to all be signed off. You're gonna wind up with a title of that vehicle for that country that you live in, that is completely different than just temporarily importing. So I wanna be really clear on that. Don't get confused about whether I'm talking about just being a tourist and passing through. That's not what I'm doing. I'm actually bringing a vehicle over to make it legal in Canada for me. So the way that you can actually import a vehicle that has never been sold legally in Canada, the simple thing is it has to be 15 years old and you're allowed to do that doesn't matter what engine's in it, it doesn't matter what crash safety it did or didn't pass, any of that stuff, as long as it's 15 years old, you can bring it over, do a bunch of paperwork, get it inspected, and it will be a legally road registered Canadian vehicle. It doesn't even matter which side the steering wheel is on, once it's 15 years old, you're good to go. For the United States, the rule is 25 years old. So again, it doesn't matter what engine's in it, it doesn't matter what side the steering wheel on, petrol, diesel, all of that is irrelevant. If the vehicle's 25 years old, you can import it and you can put plates on it from your home state and make it completely legal. So obviously it's almost 2023. That means I'd be looking at a model year of about 2007 or 2008 if I'm gonna get one for Canada or for you guys in the USA, it's about 1997, 1998 is about as new as you can go right now. And it really is that simple. Once it's old enough, 
that's it. It can be made legal and it's not even that difficult once you actually get it there. The next thing I really need to talk about though is the cost of doing this. And a lot of you maybe assume that I'm a really rich YouTuber or I just have access to unlimited money. That's not true at all. You'll see from my budgeting videos, from my how to save money videos, I just do this all with my own money on really tight budgets. So for me, I can't just go out and spend unlimited money. And unfortunately, the world is a very different place now after COVID. And so before COVID, it was really common. I would have been able to buy a Land Cruiser here in Australia, bring it over to Canada, pay for shipping, get it registered, all of that, drive it around for six months and sell it. And I still probably would have made money on the whole endeavor. If I did well, I would have made significant amount of money. So that was one of the main reasons I thought about doing it in fact, but things have changed a lot. The situation in Australia right now is that there is a huge wait list for new Land Cruisers, basically any model. And so they sell for somewhere around 70 or 80,000 Australian dollars. What's that about 60 or 50,000 US dollars. But the thing is, because there's a huge wait list, the price of used ones has gone up immensely. It's really common now for used ones to go for 100,000 Australian dollars. Yeah, that's right. Used ones are selling for more than new ones. It's a crazy world that we live in. That's just the reality. So even now when I look at classifieds, I look for sale signs, even vehicles that are 15 years old that I might be interested in buying, they actually cost more than a brand new vehicle does in Canada. That's a hard pill to swallow to end up with an older vehicle that actually costs so much more money. So the first thing to think about is the cost of actually buying one up front is now really significant. And unfortunately, shipping has gone up a lot as well. So global shipping has just been overwhelmed and it's a complete disaster. What used to cost maybe about $2,000, these days is pushing up to $10,000 just to get a vehicle from here to North America. So that's a significant cost. On the receiving end, you don't actually have to pay very much. In Canada, you get a little bit of an inspection, you have to get a compliance plate, you get a sticker, all of that is just a few hundred dollars. Depending on which province you live in, you might have to pay tax, but that is what it is no matter what you're gonna buy. And in the US, it's kind of similar. You don't end up having to pay a whole lot of money to make it legal. There's some paperwork, there's some time involved, but cost-wise, it's not significant. But unfortunately, as we sit here in the end of 2022, buying a Land Cruiser here, shipping it over, it's gonna be a very expensive vehicle by the time I get it over there. I've said previously that I really don't wanna own a vehicle that is right-hand drive for North America or for global overlanding. Of course, I bought my Gladiator here, which was right-hand drive, but the plan all along was only ever to have it in Australia. So it didn't limit me in any way, it wasn't dangerous, it didn't make driving difficult because I was driving on the correct side of the road for that vehicle. For me personally, I don't love the idea of driving an incorrect vehicle. I think it just adds complication and difficulty, toll booths, drive-throughs, all of those things. I mean, you could look at it as a novelty and fun if you wanted to. I personally think it's just kind of annoying. It's also definitely not as safe. It also makes driving kind of more stressful and more tiring. So I personally, not that excited about driving a wrong hand drive vehicle around Canada and the US. Um, and definitely, if you wanted to have one, it's a novelty, go for it, that's fun. Ah, go nuts, have fun with that. Of course too, I could look at getting one from Europe and then it would be left hand drive and it would be appropriate. I'm not in Europe, I don't speak many languages like German and French and the places where one might come up for sale. So it's gonna get difficult for me, maybe I have to pay someone to go and get one for me, I won't be able to inspect it. All of that I think just gets more complicated and more difficult. I kind of feel like while I'm here in Australia, it makes more sense to take advantage and get one in Australia. So right-hand drive, it's a net negative for me, especially too, because it limits where I can go in the world. For me, when I think about overlanding, I love the idea that I can go anywhere in the world. For me, it's about freedom, it's about choice, it's about going off into the unknown. And if I was driving a vehicle, let's say I wander down into Mexico again, I get to start heading down into Central America, I would wanna know that I can just keep going wherever I please. If there happens to be a volcanic eruption somewhere and I wanna see the lava, I don't wanna be limited by my vehicle and say, no, you can't go there because it's right-hand drive, which is true, you can't drive through Nicaragua and 
Costa Rica right now with a right-hand drive. There are places in the Middle East you can't drive. I don't like that idea. I wanna own a vehicle that can go anywhere on the planet, not a vehicle that can go lots of places, but not everywhere. Ironically enough, another major reason that it would be difficult to own a 70 series Land Cruiser in Canada or the USA is down to parts and modifications. Although they have amazing global support, they have terrible support in North America. They were never sold there. And I think a lot of people assume that you could walk into a Toyota dealer and just order parts for a 70 series. That's not true at all. The Toyota dealers in North America, they don't have access to that parts catalog. They have no idea. They've never seen one before. They have no idea what the part numbers are. They can't even order the part numbers if you know what they are. So it's not so simple if you need to upgrade things, you need to replace things that have worn out like starters or alternators, or even if you're just doing routine maintenance, even oil filters can be annoying and hard to get. And there definitely are companies that are helping with this and making it better and easier. You know, there's Land Cruisers Direct, there's quite a few of them in Canada actually who are importing this kind of stuff. But of course you're gonna pay for that and you're gonna wait. Everything's just gonna take longer and be more annoying. So again, the idea of kind of owning a bit of an exotic or a bit of an oddball vehicle kind of just sounds more like an inconvenience to me or a bit of an annoyance. I just want my vehicle to be able to go on grand adventures. I don't want to have to be waiting and dealing with like the annoyance of getting exotic parts from somewhere around the world. And so by now you can kind of tell there's a whole list of reasons why I've chosen not to do this. Although I was planning to when I first got here, it just is starting to make less and less sense as time goes on. And there's actually one final reason, and this is my major reason for not doing it. And this is quite a personal reason. It kind of applies to me, but maybe it doesn't apply to you. And that is, I think when it comes to kind of YouTube influencers and overlanding, I think there's a lot of people who go into the school of, I'm elitist, I'm better than you, I have a very expensive, very exotic vehicle. You know, you can watch me having adventures, but you can't do what I'm doing because I have an unlimited budget or because I've done some kind of shady frame swap, swapping VIN numbers around or any host of reasons why. Watching them do it is very passive and very much like watch me have adventure, but it's not about you having adventure. And when I think about it, that's exactly what I don't want my channel to be, and it's exactly the message that I don't want to put out to the world. So what that means is, I don't want to drive a vehicle that other people can't have. I think when I drove from Alaska to Argentina, people were really shocked that I used just a bone stock little Jeep, and a few people sort of said, you know, I could do that, it's actually affordable. And I think I did actually inspire a few people to do it, which makes me immensely proud. Definitely when I drove around Africa, People were really interested, especially in North America, because they looked at my Jeep and they said, oh, there's hundreds of those Jeeps getting around, thousands in fact, I could just go and buy one and I could have adventures like Dan is having. And so that really kind of encouraged and inspired me to continue down this path of doing my adventures in vehicles that regular people can just go out and buy, they can outfit and they can go and have their own adventure. The whole point of what I'm doing here, my whole passion, the road shows me, it's all about showing you guys that it is genuinely possible for ordinary people to get out and have massive adventures. And I think if I was driving some sort of exotic right-hand drive imported vehicle with some engine that you can't even get in North America, people are gonna say, oh yeah, Dan's got an Australian passport, Dan has lots of money, Dan gets to do things that we don't get to do. Too bad, I just won't get to do that in my life. That goes against everything that I wanna do and, and every message that I wanna put out to you guys. So instead, I would much rather just go and buy a vehicle that anyone in North America can buy, deck it out a little bit, turn it into a nice house on wheels, and then go and have adventure. Because then the message I'm putting out and what I'm demonstrating is, yes, you really can do it, and ordinary people can buy regular off-the-shelf vehicles and go and have massive adventures. So that's why at the conclusion of all of this, I've decided not to import a 70 series Land Cruiser. I also won't be importing a Defender for exactly the same reason. I won't be importing any kind of uh, Iveco daily or any of those kind of things. You can get them in Australia, no problem. You can't get them in North America. 
So there we go, that is a whole bunch of technical information and details that kind of go into vehicle choice and how that all plays out and influences the kind of adventures you can have, the kind of content that I can create for you guys and all those considerations and all those flow on effects and what it actually means down the road. It's all well and good to look at a big shiny Land Cruiser with a pop-up roof and a huge payload, say, oh my God, I want that. But is it actually realistic? Is it actually down to earth, honest, genuine, the best choice if you just wanna jump in and drive up to Alaska? No, it definitely is not. And that's why I won't be getting one. So I hope it's been helpful. And I hope it starts to give you some insight into the kinds of consideration that I'm putting into my next Overland vehicle. So I am going ahead. There is a new adventure coming. There is a new vehicle coming. All of that detail and all that information I'm about to start posting over on Patreon to my supporters over there. And I do have to say too, this is my last video in Australia. I'm getting on a plane in three days. So bye bye Australia and thank you immensely to my supporters over on Patreon. None of this would have been possible without you guys. This enormous adventure showing you all what Australia looks like, taking you to all the wild and remote corners. And I do hope too that I've inspired some of you to come out and have a look around. This country is incredible. It is immensely beautiful. I'll be back. I have family here. I love it here. But for now, I have bigger fish to fry and I have exotic wild destinations around the world that I'm really passionate about exploring. So that's all coming up in the future. But for now, I better put on some warm clothes. The weather forecast, it's minus 30 where I'm going. That's gonna be a shock. So thanks again very much for watching. Have fun out there and maybe I'll bump into you on the road.